Hello everyone. Mark 14:64. This is a passage where Jesus is on trial for the high priest and he asks Jesus whether he's the Messiah. And Jesus answers that he is and that from now on you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, sitting at the right hand of power. And there's parallel accounts in, in Matthew and Luke as well. I, I was watching this video of Bart Ehrman kind of debating some Trinitarians. And they were talking about this verse. And these Trinitarians were trying to get Bart Ehrman to admit that Jesus was somehow claiming to be divine. Not somehow, but claiming to be divine. And so Bart Ehrman's going, well, yeah, I guess kind of, he is, yeah. And, you know, so though they're all happy about that. Um, however, Bart Ehrman wasn't saying what they think when they use the word divine. Bart Ehrman wouldn't say that Jesus was claiming to be capital G God. And so you, you see people even writing blogs about this now and making videos about Bart Ehrman admitting that, you know, Jesus is divine or something. And Bart Ehrman was right. Um, however, these Trinitarians are completely wrong. And I found this video interesting because I've seen this many times throughout the years and it's it, it's 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 weird I have to say it's just weird how Trinitarians are thinking when they come to this passage and I can't relate to it because when I was a Trinitarian I didn't have this weird thought that they're having and I'm that's why I call it weird I, I can't grasp what's going on in their brain it's just strange, um, but I, I think I've I've, I've kind of come close enough that I could make this video and sort of capture it. But it's pretty weird. There's one other thing they do this weird kind of thing with too. Um, so let's just read the passage and we'll get into that. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Again the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One, or the Son of God? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven, or coming on the clouds of heaven, if you like. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him, Jesus, to be deserving of death. So, here's, here's kind of a, an example of what I'm talking about. Here's a random Trinitarian I found on the internet talking about this. And he's expressing what seems to be a currently popular notion. Is Jesus claiming to be divine in his response to Caiaphas in Mark 14? And if he's not, then why does Caiaphas charge him with blasphemy in the context of a question about his identity. And note how he puts that in italics and molds that. And this sort of expresses that weird idea that's going on in their head. That if you start thinking about it, it actually betrays their ignorance. And this is what they kind of hone in on. The word blasphemy and the words deserving of death. 
and they somehow get it in their heads that Jesus must be claiming to be divine in order for this to happen. And so you got to ask yourself this question. Where are Trinitarians getting the notion that blasphemy means someone necessarily claimed to be God? And they don't think it would be blasphemy to claim to be the Christ. And you see this in the video with Bart Ehrman. They're going, well, you know, it's not blasphemy to claim to be the Christ. And I've seen, you know, other Trinitarians elsewhere making that claim. And they're going, you know, what? there's no big problem but claiming to be the Messiah. But claiming to be the Son of God, ooh, that's claiming to be God. That's a big one. And that's kind of the weird idea they got going on. And they sort of betray that they don't know what blasphemy is. And they betray that they don't know what a Messiah is. They're just betraying themselves. First, it's a seriously bad premise on the part of Trinitarians to suppose these Jews wouldn't kill Jesus unless they thought they had a legitimate legal reason. Right? So when they're saying, well, you know, it's not against the Mosaic law to claim to be the Messiah, so they wouldn't be, you know, charging them with blasphemy for that. The premise is that they wouldn't do anything illegal against the law. They obviously didn't read what Jesus said about these men or they didn't listen to Jesus, or they didn't care what Jesus said, or something. Because Jesus testified these men were lying murderers, children of the devil. They didn't really care if Jesus broke a law or not. They just wanted him dead. They were murderers. Listen to what Jesus said about them. They didn't need a reason. They just needed an excuse that's what liars do. They look for an excuse. That's kind of the first problem with their, their thinking pattern here. So where are Trinitarians getting the notion that blasphemy means someone necessarily claimed to be God? Again, they don't think it would be blasphemy to claim to be the Christ. Somehow, Trinitarians have got it in their heads that blasphemy, blasphemy, is necessarily defined as a man claiming to be God. Where did they get this idea? If that's so, Jesus must be the only person in the Bible to have ever blasphemed God, at least in the eyes of the Pharisees. Did anybody else ever claim to be capital G God, the God of Israel? Do you think that's going to make any sense to imply that that's your definition of blasphemy? Come on, it's stupid. Blasphemy is giving God a bad name, a bad reputation. It's, you know, sort of defiantly making God look bad. Leviticus 24.16, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord or the name of Yahweh shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the alien as well, as well as the native, as well as the native Jew. When he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. Okay? If you blaspheme the name of God, you shall be put to death. Now let's see what Paul says. In the New Testament. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law and are confident you, you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, 
through your breaking of the law do you dishonor God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the nations because of you. Romans 2. You see what blasphemy is there? These are the people of God. The people of Yahweh. So other nations, they look at the Jews and they go, Oh, those are the people who, where, who has, have the God Yahweh. That's their God. And look at how they behave. Look at how their God, Yahweh, leads them to behave. You see how that gives Yahweh a bad name? And this is blasphemy. So if bad behavior is blasphemy, how about claiming to be God's chosen one, God's anointed one, God's choice for the king of Israel, and you're not? Do you think that might be blasphemy? If you're actually not that person, it's a no-brainer, man. It's a no-brainer. He who blasphemes the name, you give God a bad name. So where are Trinitarians getting the notion that blasphemy necessarily means someone just claimed to be their God? Where do they get this idea? Their imaginations? They sure didn't get it from the Bible. In the Bible, blasphemy is anything someone might do which makes God look bad and gives him a bad reputation, a bad name. You ascribe to God something he didn't do or say, for example, or you make it look like he endorses something he doesn't endorse, for example, and it gives God a bad name. Where are Trinitarians getting this notion that blasphemy means someone necessary claimed to be God? Where are they getting it? It's weird. I'm telling you, it's, it's weird. They don't think it would be blasphemy to claim to be the Christ. Well, Paul is saying it's blasphemy if you just behave badly. And people you know you're, you're what's supposed to be one of God's people. And you're behaving badly. That blasphemes God. But claiming to be the Messiah, no, no, that's no problem. Man, what are these people thinking? Here's what a Messiah is. It's obvious these Trinitarians don't have a clue what the Bible is teaching them on this matter. God promised David that his seed would sit on the throne over Israel. Okay, that's God's promise at 2 Samuel 7, 11 to 14. Very big promise in the Bible. Big deal. That's why they're always referring to Jesus as son of David, the seed of David, etc. The Messiah had to be the son of David according to this promise. And we see that when Jesus is born at Luke 1, 32-33. In the days of King Saul and David, Israel demanded a human king instead of having God as their king. They rejected God as their king. They said, we want a human king so we can be like all the other nations who have a king who rules and judges over them and saves, you know, leads people in battle to save them from their enemies. He's also a savior figure. When God chose David, he anointed David with his spirit to rule and judge the people of Israel. So David's an anointed one. How do you say that in Hebrew? Mashiach, Messiah. How do you say that in Greek? Christos, Christ. David was God's Christ. David sat on the throne of God, the throne of Yahweh. So did Solomon. First Chronicles 29-23 And all the people of Israel bowed down and worshipped Yahweh and King David. First Chronicles 29-20 David their Lord, First Kings chapter 1, several times. They call him David our Lord. David was God's Messiah, his Christ, God's anointed one. 
David was God's son because he ruled in God's spirit. And that's why when Solomon became king, David said this is the fulfillment of the promise. That God said, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Solomon, son of God. And then the Hebrews writer says, this refers to Jesus. I will be a father to him. He will be a son to me. Hebrews 1.5 So the Davidic anointed one, David and Solomon, were sons of God. Why? Because they had the Spirit of God. What makes us sons of God in the New Testament? We have the Spirit of God. The difference today is that David was the only one in Israel to have that Spirit. And that's why at Pentecost, Peter says, God will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Not just the king, all flesh. And that's why he was a son to God, and God was a father to him. David was God's Messiah, his Christ, God's anointed one. David was God's son because he ruled Israel in God's spirit. God didn't just leave David alone to rule, you know, willy-nilly. David was guided by God's spirit to do that ruling. So in that way, God ruled Israel through David, just like God rules through Jesus now. To sit on the throne of Yahweh, which David did, meant David executed Yahweh's authority over the people of Israel. Okay, a throne represents kingly authority. So when David sat on the throne of Yahweh, as the Bible says he did, over the kingdom of God, which it says he did, kingdom of God is the people of Israel in this case. He, that meant, to sit on that throne of God meant he was executing God's authority. God gave him the right to execute his authority. And really God was ultimately doing it through David. So to the people of Israel, David was representing God. And to God, David was representing the people of Israel. He was in the middle, like a mediator, like Jesus. Because of God's promise to David that his seed would sit on this throne, these Jews, in Jesus' day, expected this son of David to come, and they knew exactly what the coming Messiah was, because David was all these things. The Messiah would be the chosen king of Israel, like David, and son of God, like David, because he was the anointed one, like David, anointed in God's Holy Spirit, like David. The Jews knew this. You know, when they said, you know, when they were talking about him being the Messiah, they knew what a Messiah was. They just, you know, didn't pull this word out of the air somewhere. They knew what the expected Messiah was supposed to be. Trinitarians obviously don't, who were, who were, you know, they got this weird idea about this passage. Otherwise, they wouldn't be having this weird idea. Numerous passages in the New Testament tell us how God gave the risen Jesus all authority in heaven and earth when... Jesus froze from the dead, and he seated Jesus at his right hand and made him Lord. And Daniel himself gave us a prophecy of his exaltation. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Okay, son of man is the Aramaic term for human being. That is how you have to refer to a human being in Aramaic. That's how you do it. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel 7. When did this happen? The New Testament tells us over and over and over and over and over and over. When Jesus rose from the dead, and God seated him at his right hand, giving him all authority in heaven and earth, and subjecting all things to Jesus. In other words, God gave Jesus, the man, the right to execute the authority of the throne of God. That's what it means to sit at the right hand of God. That's what that language means. And look at what Jesus says. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am, and you, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Okay, there's one thing these Jews knew for sure, what that meant. That meant Jesus was claiming that he was about to receive the right to execute the authority of God. Their God. That's what it means to sit at God's right hand. They would also know that you are not claiming to be God. You are claiming to be someone whom God is giving his authority to. And coming with the clouds of heaven refers to judgment. And we've seen that term in Daniel 7, where Daniel is prophesying what Jesus is here saying is about to happen. And it is about to happen when he rises from the dead. The coming Davidic Messiah would have the right to execute their God's authority. Just as David had the right to execute God's authority. David only had the right over the people of Israel. And that meant he, Jesus, had the right to execute God's judgment. Same with David, actually. And that's what this verse is about, at the bottom. God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. Who is going to judge the world? What does this verse say? Who is doing the judging? God. How? How is God doing the judging? Through a man he has appointed. Who? W-H-O. Who is doing the judging? God is doing the judging. How, H-O-W, how is God going to do this judging? Through a man, through a man he has appointed. That's how he's going to do it. Just as David was how God ruled Israel. Same idea. So here's the gist of the whole thing. You have judges judging Jesus, their judge. These men had Jesus on trial and were proceeding to pass judgment upon him. As Jesus tells us, they sat in Moses' seat, which meant they saw themselves to be the judges of Israel. The Elohim of Psalm 82, 6. You are Elohim, sons of the Most High. Okay, he's talking about the judges of Israel at Psalm 82, 6. And that's because the judges are called Elohim, gods, at Exodus 22, 8 to 9. And the reason for this is because they're representing God. And they will righteously judge because God has essentially empowered them to righteously judge the people of Israel. David had been given the right to execute God's authority over Israel. And because he is the messianic son of David, the promised Messiah, son of David, Jesus was telling his trial judges, that he was about to be given the right to execute the authority of their God's throne. That's what right hand of God means. 
And that meant that he, this man Jesus, was telling them, these Jews, that he would have the authority to judge them. The very men who presumed to be judging him. And so these judges were judging Jesus, their judge whom God had appointed. And of course, they didn't know that. But that's the thing you're supposed to see in this passage. That this man, Jesus, would be the means that God would judge the world. That's what Acts 17.31 is telling you. Same thing at Romans 2.16, really. Put yourself in the shoes of the high priest. Can you imagine being in the shoes of these men who saw themselves as righteous judges about to pass judgment upon Jesus? Remember, he was innocent. You are judging him, and he is telling you that not only is he going to judge you, he is going to be righteously executing that divine judgment upon you from the throne of your God. It's his judgment versus yours. And why is it a divine judgment? Because God is doing the judging. How is God doing the judging? Through Jesus. Jesus is anointed in his spirit. Just as David was anointed in God's spirit so that he would righteously rule and judge over Israel. How would you feel? You might tear your clothes. You might be so indignant that this man standing in front of you would presume to say that he is going to judge the high priest of Israel from the throne of of his God, the high priest's God. Can you imagine saying that to the high priest and why he would be so indignant? Jesus is telling this high priest that he's going to judge him from the throne of this high priest's God, Yahweh. Do you think that might be why he tore his clothes? Maybe. What further need do we have of witnesses? How do you think that translates? Maybe something like this. This man has just made himself superior to us. Are we going to put up with this? These are murderers who conspired to kill the Son of God. They are not righteous law keepers like Trinitarians like to present them. Why they really wanted to kill Jesus, we're told. Pilate answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And this is just a commentary by Mark. For he was aware that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. Envy. Kind of like the devil is envious of man. That's what you're supposed to get. Yes, it would be blasphemy to claim you were the anointed one of God. Obviously, whom God chose to rule from Yahweh's throne over his people, yes, it would be blasphemy if, in fact, you are not that coming Messiah. It would be assigning a lie to Yahweh if you are not that Messiah, which he chose and anointed, and that gives God a bad name. But as it is, these Jews really didn't care about the law anyway. Jesus tells us they were lawless. They were hypocrites. They were lying, murderous children of the devil and just wanted Jesus dead. 
Their judgment was a liar's excuse. He was an innocent man. They were just looking for an excuse to kill him. Why can't people see that? It's so obvious. In fact, we're told that. And yet people come up with all these other contraptions. It was not a desire to be lawful on their part. They were children of the devil. They were liars. Hypocrites. Why can't people see this? And yes, it would be blasphemy to claim to be God's anointed one, if you're not. It's funny how the same Trinitarians, if you don't agree with them, and you'll say, and you say something like, "No, God's not a three-person being. God is not a Trinity," and they'll go, "Blasphemy! <laughs> That's blasphemy." But claiming to be God's Messiah, no, not so much. Pitiful, pitiful. You know, we got to get back to what these words, these passages, and all these things mean that we're being told in our Bibles. And the reason people don't see them, the biggest reason of all, can be summed up in one word. One. Trinity. It's an idol. you got to get rid of that thing. It blinds you. makes you deaf. You can't hear. You can't see. You don't see the obvious truths that we're being told. And that's something we really want. We want to be led by the Spirit of God into all the truth. God bless you.